we're here to have a talk about deep learning. Looks to be very fascinating and interesting. Um, please welcome Tobias. Cool. Okay. Cool. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, glad to see such a big um, turnout. So, yeah, um, I've got a tutorial slot, and we'll try and um, make it somewhat interactive. Um, you can get all the code. I just pushed the last final version at, at 15 minutes ago. So, if you've got an older version, do a pull. Otherwise, clone the repo now. Um, <coughs> just a little bit about me. Um, Trained as a physicist, um, been working as a quant in the financial industry. I work uh, for an investment management firm um, where we try and use data analysis and um, machine learning to find the best um, long-term investment outcomes for our investors. And um, yeah, very much into Python and attended PyCon last year, part of the Cape Town Python user group, and also part of the Cape Town Deep Learning Meetup. So if there's anything in here, that um, strikes your fancy and you're in Cape Town and you want to get more into deep learning, come find us on Meetup, it's Cape Town Deep Learning, and yeah, come join our meetups. Um, all right, so just for the, the outline for the tutorial, I've kind of got three objectives. So first of all, I just want to show you that um, deep learning in Python is simple but powerful, and um, you can do all the cutting edge stuff. Then we'll take a step back and just give an introduction to artificial neural networks. And um, if you're familiar with machine learning, this will be um, obviously very basic, so just bear with us uh, at that point. And then th um, the third step, we'll try and get more into deep learning. And, uh, but again, an introductory tutorial level. So we'll pick up sort of with um, what I'm aiming for is autoencoders, so, so 2006 to 2010 level. Um, we're not going for quite the latest cutting edge um, stuff, but hopefully it will give you uh, an introduction to the field and then there's lots of kind of good, um, more advanced talks out there that you can go and get into on your own. Okay, now the requirements, um, all the, the code in the notebook is in Python 3.4, but it's got future imports so you can run it in legacy Python as well. Um, you need Keras, I think, um, greater than 1.0, and Theano or TensorFlow. I know on the, um, on the advertisement I said TensorFlow. Um, had a bit of trouble getting that all up and running on Windows, so I'll be using Theano as the back end here. But it's, if you're on Linux, it's very easy to swap out. You just sort of, in your config um, file, you can specify that you want to use TensorFlow in the as a back end with Keras if you've got it installed and run it on TensorFlow. Just here's the, uh, the command to clone the code if you want. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into it. So the reason I use Python is because it makes everything awesome and simple. And a lot of you will probably know this um, XKCD um, cartoon. Sorry if it's a bit small. But um, the, actually, does anyone have a laser pointer? Um, no. So the, the key line is this, how's you flying? Over here, import anti-gravity. And if you want to do deep learning in, in Python, it's almost as simple as import Keras. And you set um, from there. Now, obviously, that's a bit of an oversimplification. In practice, it's a little bit more difficult. So just as a, an example, I'm just going to run th very quickly through a very kind of uh, a sort of um, slightly advanced example. So here we've got a, this is the <coughs> your import code for all the pieces that you need for running a convolutional neural network for, to classify handwritten digits. So these are imports. Then this is the code for setting up the network. And then you've got two more lines here, model.compile, which um, compiles the model into uh, executable code, and then we fit it on the training data. And because I haven't got CUDA installed on my machine, each um, epoch takes about um, 25 minutes. So I've run that overnight last night, and just loaded the final weights. But when we, um, I did 15 epochs on this, and we get a test accuracy of 99.06, which with almost zero work involved. So you can get, kind of probably like 
what was state-of-the-art performance 15 years ago, now in like 10 lines of Python. So it's pretty awesome. Um, this is the best accuracy you'll see for today. So <laughs> if you just care about the results, you can leave at this point. I'm going to show you now how to do everything wrong and what, how we've learned over the last 10 years and sort of got um, to this point. So I'll show you a lot of um, simple things. Um, yeah, ways that you can end up in dead ends, and hopefully maybe that will help you avoid um, those sort of dead ends if in your own kind of code if you're working with it. All right, so building and training neural networks in Python is simple, but it's also powerful in that you can get, um, like, this, for example, if you clone this GitHub repo and you've got um, CUDA and everything installed on your machine, you c I don't know if any of you have seen these um, style transfer um, examples, but you can get that running on your laptop. Again, just clone this repo, run a bit of Python, and you can put in your own pictures and make it look painted in the style of Van Gogh's Starry Night um, with very little um, code. So you might have to wait a while because, yeah, depending on how fast the GPU is, but um, it's you don't have to write super complex mathematical code. Like it's the the networks have been predefined. You can download the pre-trained model weights from the international research groups and just get it running um, on your, your PC or laptop. All right, so now the second part of the talk, the, just a, an introduction to neural networks. So maybe it's part of machine learning, so we want um, to build intelligent systems. And the, or we want learning systems, actually. So when you write, normally write a piece of code, it does exactly what you tell it to. Now you actually say, well, rather than having to explicitly tell my code everything that I want to do, I want to, it to learn from examples by itself. And we have an existence proof of an intelligent system, i.e. humans, because it's, um, most of us would have not known Python at some point, so obviously we've, we've learned, so we know that intelligent systems are possible, learning systems. So let's try and um, copy that because in other um, fields of engineering, we've seen that like copying nature has helped. So, but the question is, what, to what level of abstraction? So do we copy the brain exactly, or do we take some high level of abstraction? So if you look at flight, for example, the first um, person that tried to like, have um, heavier than air man-powered flight was, um, I don't even know his name, Lavignon III de Clément Albert, and he built a flying machine that was a copy of a bat, but um, that turned out to be not very successful, and hence he kind of, he's on the, um, on the side margins of history, but who we remember is the Wright brothers. So it's important to get the right level of abstraction. So we're gonna take some inspiration from the brain, but we're gonna abstract it. So if you look at the brain, how does the, the brain work? We've got neurons, so on the left-hand side, we've got some these dendrites, the input signals, then there's some sort of magic happens in the neuron, and it decides whether or not, depending on what inputs it gets, whether to fire a signal, and then those get fed for, to various outputs. So we can represent, represent that mathematically as some sort of inputs, then there's some sigma here, some sort of summation of the inputs, and, and some activation function, and that transforms the, the inputs into the output. And then to build an artificial brain, we put lots of these neurons together. And every neuron has some internal logic that makes it fire or not. And we feed all of those to all the um, neurons higher up in the net network. And um, yeah, so we have a multi-layer um, neural network. But each neuron is made of the same kind of building block. So mathematic and the... Yeah, we can choose various different activation functions um, for what, how a um, neuron decides um, what to do. So the important ones here are, the or original one people looked at was the sort of, in the 50s, the th um, threshold right on the left. That didn't work so well. Then we worked for a long time with the logistic sigmoid in the middle and the tan H. And recently, the, what's on this particular picture named the hinge loss, but it's normally referred to as a rectified linear unit or a ReLU, has been found to be very successful in deep networks. But we'll get more into that um, later. But basically, you can replace the sigma there with a different choice of functions, and they've got different um, pros and cons. 
So then mathematically, here we've got a number of input signals. We assign, multiply each one with a weight. So the input signals are from the x1 to xm. Then we multiply them with a weight, um, mi1 to mm, wm. Um, sum them all up and then put it through our activation function, which is nonlinear, and that's actually quite crucial. But I, I won't go in more into detail around that, but it's important that it's nonlinear. And in the end, we look at all the um, we look at, at the final layer, we look at all the outputs of a neuron, and we have some sort of target that we compare to. So we want the, the neural network to produce something, either to like, come up with a label for something, or um, um, like a picture or, or something or other, and we compare how closely does our output match the um, expected output. And I've just got us up here to show you that um, this is a categorical cross-entropy um, loss function. Um, we're not going to look at any of the maths. This will be the last um, formula we look at. Just to say that, well, um, we look at, to train the neural network, we compare each output to the expected output and sum all the differences. And then we try and see how do we adjust the weights in the neural network to get um, the best output that we can. Um, I'm not spending a lot of time on the, um, the maths and how that all works. If you're interested in that, do Andrew Ng's kind of machine learning course on Coursera. It's very good. It gives you a good introduction. I just sort of have it here, that uh, a bit of a framework. But the beauty of Python is that you don't really need to know too much about um, the details. But I'll, I'll try and give you an, um, an intuitive explanation um, just in the next slide as to how you, this will work. See, the, the overall picture is that, sorry, let me just go back. Um, uh, at the top layer of the neural network, we have our input, let's say we want to work with pictures, we have our input picture, we have all these transformations. At the top, we get some output, we compare those outputs um, to the expected output, and then we, uh, we sum those differences, which will give us some loss function, which we'll try and minimize. The, um, equivalently to minimizing a loss function, we can try and maximize an objective function. So the, the way to think about that, we're here in, in Cape Town, and let's look at the, the terrain of the objective function being the table mountain. And I put you outside, and I said, well, I'll blindfold you. You've got to get to the top of Table Mountain. How might you go about it? So first of all, you start stumbling around. You probably walk in some buildings, walk into traffic. So we will want that to be no good. So we want to take the real world. We'll take a slightly like um, stylized picture of Table Mountain. So imagine Table Mountain as with smooth contours, with no, um, with no um, low-level detail. But now you're still you're outside, you're blindfolded, how are you going to get to Table Mountain? So what I'm going to propose is I'll give you a long stick, let's say a 10-meter long stick, and you, get, you can feel around you. So you turn in a circle, and you, you, yeah, you put, um, you put the stick out to the ground sort of all around you, which will give you, if you do one full circulation um, um, circle, it will give you a feeling for the gradient. So from that, you'll be able to see what's my average slope here, and you follow the direction of steepest um, gradient. So you take a number of steps in that direction, and then you do another um, pass. So depending on where you start, let's say if you, if you start over here, roughly where we are, go up, probably end up on Devil's Peak. If you start at the waterfront, you probably will end up on Signal Hill, or maybe and start in C point, end up somewhere here between them, and you might sort of end up randomly going left or right and end up in Lion's Head. Or if you start anywhere near here, you'll end up on the Table Mountain Plateau, and maybe with some luck you'll find yourself to the highest point, which is McClare's Beacon right on, on the top there. Now, in, as you can see, there are multiple, uh, multiple high points that you can get to. So 
in the 90s, people were very concerned about this, that the, um, you have these, all these local optima, and you're going to get stuck in the, wrong, in the wrong ones. In practice, what they found in the last 10 years is that it doesn't really matter actually too much. If you're on top of Table Mountain, if all you care about is height, most, if, as long as you end up somewhere on Table Mountain, you actually the height's all pretty like, um, similar. The, so um, what's more of a problem is these kind of things over here, where you end up at a saddle point, and then you end up spending a, long, a lot of time kind of going um, sideways until you find another uh, bit of slope again to get to the top. But um, yeah, that's basically the uh, gradient descent um, Method. So we look at the gradient at every point and then move in the direction of steepest gradient. Now, um, again, Keras takes care of all of that for us, or it uses Tiana, which has got automatic differentiation, which means you can just put in your loss function <coughs> and it will automatically work out the gradients and all of that. You don't have to concern yourself. Whereas if you do Anne Ring's machine learning course, you know, for um, pedagogical reasons, you work out all the gradients, plug them in, good exercise. But if you just want to go and get stuff done, import Keras, it will sort everything out underneath. Um, but it's sometimes important to know sort of some of the, the background. All right, so, um, oh, so one more thing I wanted to say on that. Mm. So when we look at our examples, you'll see that what we actually do in the end is called stochastic gradient descent, not, not gradient descent. Now, the actual gradient are, so here we've got two coordinates, right? We've got um, longitude and latitude that we want to move in. In our space, when we're doing the optimization, let's say we've got 60,000 data points, you, in order to work out the loss function, you actually have to evaluate the gradient on all 60,000 data points. Now, if you picture yourself standing on the slope tail mountain with your stick and you're going around, you've got to tap 60,000 times, that's going to take you quite a while, and then you do one step, and um, you move forward, like tapping at 60,000 times will give you the right, probably the best estimate of the gradient, but it's not necessary. Like maybe if you do 100 taps, that'd be good enough. You get a pretty good picture of where <coughs> the gradient is. So that's what we do in practice. We don't use all the trailing examples to fix the gradient. We do a small subset, and it's not the perfect gradient. So there's a bit of randomness introduced, which is why it's called stochastic but it gets us, um, it's good enough in practice and it gets us to where we want to go much faster. So, very quick hand wavy explanation of stochastic gradient descent. <laughs> All right, neural networks in Python. So I'm gonna be talking about Keras. Keras is what makes neural networks in Python awesome. It's a high level library for working with neural networks and it can use different backends. So Theano or TensorFlow. Fiona kind of has been around uh, longer, um, and it was one of the sort of, uh, I think, original sort of frameworks that had automatic differentiation, computational graphs, GPU acceleration. Obviously, last year, Tensorf Google published TensorFlow, and they've stolen a lot of the limelight, and obviously, being Google, it's got like, I don't know, thousands of stars on GitHub and receiving active development, so it's um, really taking off. Nice thing with Keras is you don't really have to care. You can just write your code in Keras, and if um, for whatever application Tiano works better, you can use Tiano. If you want to switch to TensorFlow at some point, change one line in your config file, um, as long as you get TensorFlow installed, and then off you go. All right, so the data we're going to be working with is the MNIST um, handwritten data, um, handwritten digits. So it's the simplest sort of standard data set. You'll find tons of tutorials on the internet, but it's, it's nice and small, um, it's quick to download and easy to, to work with on your laptop. And it consists of 70,000 handwritten digits, which already come pre-kind of divided into 60,000 for training and 10,000 for testing. And each um, is a 28 by 28 um, pixel image. All right, so let's load the, the data. So in the Keras, what you <coughs> need to do is from Keras data sets, import MNIST. And then this commented outline is what you actually use to load it. Because I had that convolutional net earlier up in my notebook, um, I've commented out here because it was giving me problems. But so we can look at the, the shape. So what we get is 
we get um, a set of images which are 60,000 by 28 by 28 and 60,000 um, labels, which are just yeah, 60,000 numbers of what the actual digit is. Is it a zero, a one, a two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? All right, so let's, I think, the first thing to do with data is always visualize it. So let's plot here, so we can see here. These are 28 by 28, um, grayscale or black and white. Uh, I think actually they're um, integers, so in, inter, integer intensities. And <coughs> handwritten digits, most of them okay, but you can see there's some like pretty like badly uh, written ones. Let me try and find one. Like let's, let's say that, for example, is that a four or a nine? Um, and anything else? Which one? The top of F. Yeah, it's also five. So, see, not um, not a trivial task. Well, all right. And also, what I'll be doing later on, we've got this IPython widget, so we can just look in a little bit more de detail as to each of the ones. Let's see. Cool. All right. All right. So the first thing. Machine learning, is these come as images. Now we've got standard um, machine learning um, algorithms. They normally expect just a vector of, of numbers. So the first task is to transform your data into a format that the machine learning algorithm will expect. So I've written this little function here, two features. So yeah, normally in machine learning, one training set, um, um, or as one example, but we call each data point is a feature. So we take our data, and 28 by 28 is 784 numbers, so we reshaped them into um, an array with um, 60,000 rows and 784 columns, and then we also transform um, the, um, um, what's it, the 8-bit integers into float 32s for, um, um, yeah, and that's float 32s because normally that works better on GPUs, single precision rather than float um, 64s. I'm not actually using GPUs here, but um, just it's quite common in neural networks. And then just for plotting our exams later on, I've got the inverse tra um, transform where we take the um, feature vector and transform it back into an image for visualization. Okay, everyone with me so far? Yeah. Right, now splitting the data into training and test set. Um, the th thing with machine learning is that the algorithms become very good at learning what um, the examples you give them, and so it's important to hold out some, some test data, that you don't test the algorithm on the same data that you've trained on. Otherwise, you just learn to memorize um, examples, and we don't, you, know, you want to actually learn things about the data that you can generalize to unseen data. So it's always important to hold out some test data. Now, Keras already does that in its load function. The data it comes back already pre-sorted into 60,000 um, training and testing examples. But if, you know, if you're working on your own data, an important step to hold out some test data that isn't, um, don't look at it all until the end. No, I think it's, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think a common sort of guidelines, maybe a third, um, if you can afford it. I mean, sometimes if you don't have that much data, people then try and like um, become a bit stingy and like you try and make less test data and keep more for training data. But yeah, it depends how much data you have available. Right, so, um, the next step is that a neural network um, produces outputs of the neuron fires or doesn't fire. So it's kind of like a binary zero, one output. Whereas our outputs, we had 10 um, labels, right? So 10 numbers. So what we do is we transform each number, which could be one of 10 classes, into a 10, um, 10 element vector, which is called a one hot encoding. So I think that's the most easiest explained by um, looking at the, some examples. So if we look at the first two, um, examples were a uh, five and a one. So if you look at the one, it's in the original data set, it's encoded as a zero, but we've made it a, a 10 element vector with a one in the, in the first um, position. Similarly, with the first example, which was a five, we've got a one in the, in the fifth 
position. So in, I mean, for this, we've, since we've only got 10 classes, that's not very expensive because you've only got um, 10 examples. But if you've got, say, let's say you're doing ImageNet and you've got, I don't know, 10,000 labels, then you initially might think, oh, well, it, that's quite expensive to have this 10,000 um, um, element vector, but it's still kind of, it's what you end up doing and it's not that expensive in the, in the bigger picture. But, so yeah, just, that's a, a one-hot encoding and we need that because then we'll compare each output layer of a neuron, will, one neuron will be mapped to each, um, each element in that vector. All right, so let's actually build a, a neural network, so a multi-layer perceptron, which is just a feed-forward um, neural network. So our input layer will have 784 um, elements. That was our, our pictures. We'll have one hidden layer of 512 um, neurons, and then our output layer is 10 neurons, which corresponding to our 10 um, labels that we just in the one hot encoding. And then we run one epoch. An epoch is how is the number of passes you do through the training set. So one epoch means we'll we'll run through the whole um, a whole 60,000 um, test cases once. And the batch size is the is the number of examples we'll use in one batch to work out the gradient before we move make our next step. So if you remember on the thing going up Table Mountain, it's how many taps of the stick we do to de determine the direction where to move next. <coughs> Is everyone up to speed on that? How, so. how, how do you decide the number of We'll come to that later. Um, I guess it's what you... Yeah, um, whether you're getting good results and how much you can afford. I mean, let's go deeper. All right, so Keras, it's very simple. We, we, yeah. The model, you create a sequential, um, which is kind of the main model um, building block. That's like our main class. And then we add layers to it. So we add a dense layer, which means every we'll have a connection from every input neuron to every hidden um, layer neuron. And then as an activation function, we use the sigmoid um, function. And then the, the final layer, from the hidden layer to the output layer, is we use a, a soft max. And what that um, does is it's kind of its exponent over the sum, which it means it maps it to the 0, 1 range. So if you meant, like, let's say the output numbers were random, you just, but they're all positive numbers, so you take each number over the sum of all the other ones, which means in the end, you've got something that will sum to one. So it's a probability. So we'll interpret it as the probability that for this input image, um, each of the 10 neurons, it represents that, um, that number. So we're mapping it into a probability. And then what we want, we'll measure the difference. So that um, sort of complicated loss function that I showed you earlier was just the difference of saying, well, um, for the first let's say an the first example, which was the five, in the fifth place, we should have a one, but the probability we actually got, got was 30%. So we've got a 70% mismatch, whereas in the another digit, the probability was 50%, but it should have been a zero. So we, we add up all the differences in the probabilities and see that is our loss. And then we do that for all the training examples. And then every t after every run, we try and see, well, how can we minimize the differences in the probabilities and the actual values that we wanted to achieve on each of the neurons? All right, so now we've defined it. The, the way Keras works is you build up a computational graph. So when you start building the network, it doesn't actually do any computation yet. It just builds up the graph. And then you've got this compiler step where it says, well, depending on what my back end is, it actually sort of runs a just-in-time compilation step and it executes it into efficient, um, yeah, efficient sort of machine code. I'm not quite sure actually what level it, it, it works at, some C code or LLVM. Uh, but you compile it down, and then when you actually run the fit function, you run it over the data set so that you have got the, the hot loop is efficient kind of code that's uh, it's not um, python so you're not having uh, yeah you're not suffering performance wise from using python you've still got efficient kind of low level code executing your main step all right so 
So that's maybe what I should mention is in the in the compilation you can specify what um, loss function you want. So for categorical labels like I showed you, you want the categorical cross entropy. For the optimizer, we use SGD, i.e. stochastic gradient descent. And then this metrics accuracy is just that as it's I've pre-computed all of these answers, but normally if you're running interactively, you, it will kind of show you as it goes along. So if you don't put that in there, it will show you nothing. It will just show you the loss function, which you might not know how to interpret, whereas the accuracy here will actually keep you in updated um, estimates of how many examples are you getting right or how many are you getting wrong. All right, so once you've compiled it, then you just fit it. So you see the first is our input set, and the... Um, Second um, parameter is the output. So these are the images. On the right-hand side are the labels in the one-hot encoding, batch size, and number of epochs. And I've just run one epoch. And we see that the loss function is two, but I guess that's pretty arbitrary. But accuracy here means we've got 41% um, accuracy with this very simple um, neural network. And that was on the on the data itself, so we can't really trust that. So we need to evaluate it on the held out out of sample data. And we see that it's actually done slightly better, 61% um, accuracy on the, on the output. So that's the, the basic model for how to set up a neural network in Keras. Uh, any questions at this point? Because now, from now on, it will just be building slightly more um, complex ones. Um, but this is kind of the basic um, procedure that you follow. All clear? Sure. Just curious why there's such a big difference um, between the test um, and the training data. I mean, that's like 40 to 60% is significant. Um, let me just see how, what, how it did define this model. Um, Yeah, I'm not actually, uh, I'm not 100% sure on this one. Um, so, anyone else wants to answer? I'm just going to uh, think out loud here, but it might be because you don't have a regularization there. Yeah, so that's where I, where I went back to look because normally I use dropout, and then when, when it actually comes to evaluation, you take the dropout off, but that wasn't the case in, in, in this one um, here. So, by the way, I actually meant to mention at the beginning. Um, I use traditional sort of machine learning in my day job. This um, deep learning is a, a sort of a side project, and I thought, what better way to learn about it than to give a talk about it? Um, so, if there are any experts in the audience that want to um, um, come in and like augment the answers for the benefit of everyone, please um, go ahead. Like that's um, not um, claiming to be an expert on this completely. Um, all right, and here we can look at just some of our examples. So we had 60% accuracy. So let's see how we, how we do. So here, this is a 7. We predicted 7 and an actual 7. Um, 2, 5, 1, 4. Let's see until we get one wrong. Oh, here we go. 4 and a 9. So you can see that 4s and the 9s are actually often tend to be problems because the it's whether you close that top loop or not. And it, for some reason, it doesn't learn good features um, often in, in those ones. Zero and a five. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a hard five. I mean, you can see it could be a very uh, badly drawn zero. Yeah, so you can see it's quite fun to play around. All right, so that was um, a single layer um, neural network. And it says, now, why would you ever want to go and deeper? Because especially there was this theorem that said, like, universal approximation theorem, which says that. Um, Simple, like single layer neural networks are universal function approximators. So they can actually represent any function that you want to, to learn. So you think, oh, it's job solved. We'll just use single layer neural networks. Why do anything else? The problem with what the theorem doesn't state is how many neurons you need to, to solve your task. And it actually tends to be sort of exponential in the complexity of what you want to learn. So you very quickly have an exponential number of neurons, uh, which means you need even more data. And in practice, it doesn't actually, um, doesn't, yeah, it's just, um, doesn't generalize well. So it's a sort of um, bias variance trade-off that you, they just learn to recognize the training data very well, and it doesn't generalize well out of sample. 
And I think where's, yeah, you get a lot of um, power from the combinations of multiple layers. So um, it's a bit of an aside here, but the, how many of you saw um, followed when AlphaGo beat Lee Seidel at the beginning of the year in, in the match? So, so that AlphaGo is a, a deep neural network uh, reinforcement learning algorithm from Google that learned Go. Now Go is supposed to be the sort of hardest um, game for um, for computers to learn because it's got a very deep um, search tree. So I think I can't remember the numbers. I think chess is sort of roughly to, is equivalent to the number of atoms in the universe, ten to the eighty. Whereas with Go, you're more in the and the number of 10 to the 200 kind of combinations that you need to explore. So they thought Go wasn't be going to be cracked by computers until kind of 20, 30 years from now. So the fact that someone beat um, Go at the uh, beginning of this year was a big um, surprise and sort of just showing how fast this um, field is advancing and how powerful some of the techniques have become. But there was a statement by Demis Hassabis, who is the the founder of the subsidiary that, um, of Google that built this algorithm, that there are more Go positions than there are atoms in the universe. So that's for press statements, always sounds very good. And, but then there was an sort of interesting blog post by Peter Norvik that actually the, the problem is the small number of atoms in the universe. That the <laughs> and says well, most people under, um, appreciate the, how many combinations of things they are. So even if you look at pixels, let's say a, a very sort of normal a digital camera on your phone will have 12 million pixels. How many pictures can it um, produce? So and we say, like, let's do a n normal color, color model of um, 24 bits. So you've got 17 million distinct colors per, pic per pixel. Now you multiply that by so to the power of um, 12 million you end up with a lot. So if you need to simplify it down to 300 pixels or 12 pixels, um, which of them do you think will have a similar number of possible pictures to atoms in the universe? So let's start with 12 million pixels, show of hands. Uh, 300 million pixels. And 12 pixels, so tentative. <laughs> yeah, so I guess the way I've set up the problem, you could have guessed that the, the right answer is um, 12 pixels, because you take 17 million to the power of 12, you already get 10 to the 86 um, combinations. So, and that's already power of six more, so a million times more pictures, 12 um, pixel pictures than there are atoms in the universe. So the atoms universe is a big for con a collection of things, but it's not um, very big for um, combinations of things. And that's kind of yeah what we normally refer to as the curse of dimensionality. So um, yeah, so when you look at now the pictures that we care about uh, that are on the internet, which are mostly pictures of cats and dogs, like those form a very small subset of the space of all pictures. So we need some very sort of sparse representations to try and find the bits of interest that are um, of interest to us. Whereas if you just have linear or single layer neural networks, you're going to run into this curse of dimensionality problem where you have too many possible things. So in order to fight the curse of dimensionality, we need to make it um, use it to our advantage. So we introduce um, multiple layers because now we have different features at different levels in the hierarchy and we can get the curse of um, dimensionality working for us because we can now also have um, com combinations. So this was already sort of realized um, a while ago and people wanted to build um, multi-layer neural networks but the problem was in the practicalities that um, for various reasons which we'll um, see just now, it, um, it didn't work. And we couldn't train them with the backpropagation and the algorithms we had in, at the end of the 90s and the early 2000s. And that we needed the breakthroughs of the last um, 10 years to help with that. But yeah, what you fundamentally want is um, multi-level 
um, representations of um, things you're trying to represent. So we have two examples here. On the left is visuals, and where we have multiple layers of the neural network, and you can see that uh, at the lowest level, it um, learns kind of, and these have come out of actual neural nets that have been trained um, recently, and you find out that the neural network at the lower level learned very basic kind of filters, like um, diagonal lines, vertical lines, sort of uh, things, and people that work in, in graphics, computer graphics, might recognize these as filters that humans have actually hand-engineered and put into the models before. And then at the me medium level, you've got slightly more complex things, like maybe in like a nose or an eye, and then at the highest level, we've got actual faces, etc. Now, the way computer vision, for example, worked before was that people would hand-engineer all these low-level filters and then pass things through them and then try and build up vision systems. And the, the amazing breakthrough with deep learning in the last 10 years has been is that we've just had more data, bigger data sets, and learned, um, let the, the neural networks learn by themselves and then looked at what they learned. And they found that they've much um, found the same things that we were putting in in the first place. So that's almost like a canonical kind of, um, representation that you want, um, you want, which is quite a, um, yeah, I mean, it's quite a surprising and sort of affirming result. And if you think about the brain, is that the brain is a, ultimately an incredibly deep neural network in that you've got all these um, different layers and it actually almost like loops back. So I think this also kind of gives us a hint that m maybe in order to achieve inte general intelligence, this is the direction we kind of need to move in. And then on the right hand side, we've got um, just the same example for sound, and I don't work much with sound, so I don't really know how to interpret those for you, but similarly, they found that having hierarchical representations uh, really helped and brought, um, bring speech recognition forward. All right, so that's the motivation for why you want to go uh, um, for deep neural networks. Now we'll try and do it naively and see why it didn't work for a long time. I said, okay, well, let's just build a two-layer neural network. So much like before, but here I've put a for loop in, and we have two hidden layers, and I've sort of set it up so that we have the same number of neurons um, as we had before, just split over two layers. Compile it, run it. Now, if you look at after one epoch, what is our accuracy here? Um, 11, whereas 11%, 11 whereas before we had um, 44%. So I said, okay, well, that didn't work very well. Let's train it some more. So we do another epoch, it's increased slightly, 11.8. So the previous example, we only traded on one epoch, we already got to 40%, um, percent, whereas now here we've trained it twice, we're still at 11.8%. Something is just not quite working. And so that was the problem for a long time, this um, problem of vanishing gradients, that um, you know, as the neural network becomes um, uh, deeper, it becomes more and more difficult for the information of the discrepancies at the top layer to get filtered back to the, the weights in the neural network as you go down. So that's where people got stuck for a long time, in that we, you, we saw the need for training um, deep neural networks, but we just couldn't do it in practice. So then, um, as far as I know, the, uh, so big, the big breakthrough that really um, led to the field of deep um, learning um, was this paper by Jeffrey Hinton in 2006, reducing the dimensionality of data with neural networks from science, where he yeah, used autoencoders to pre-train uh, a deep neural network. So we'll try and um, you know, do that next. So we look at what is an autoencoder. So it sounds very f fancy, but it, it's actually quite simple. We're saying, well, rather than trying to predict the labels, let's just um, see if we can predict the inputs back with just a more sparse, inf um, with a more sparse subset. So it's really like a compression task. So we've got 784 input neurons. We'll have a hidden layer with 512 neurons, and we'll just try and predict the input back. So we've got this kind of um, compression step. And if we can do that, then we can stack them and reduce it at every level until we kind of get to 10 neurons at the, at the output level. 
and maybe we'll learn useful things at, e at every step. Um, so just, yeah, this is kind of quite a key thing. I just want to check that everyone um, got that. So what we did before, we had as the input the picture and as the output the label. Here we're just putting the, the output, um, the picture again. And we just have um, yeah, 512 neurons in the middle. So we've got less information in the middle than we've got at the output. So the neural network kind of has to decide what is the most salient information to I don't have every single pixel value, but maybe there's a lot of redundancy so I can compress um, the neural network. I mean, the, uh, compress the, the data space. So is that everyone clear on that? Because we'll build up from this. Yeah? Okay. Um, so here the loss function doesn't really mean much in um, terms, but you can see, well, I did it once on one epoch, and okay, that didn't actually um, work very well. So my reconstructions here aren't, um, aren't very good. So you know, on the left I've got the original pictures and on the right is what I've kind of reconstructed. Now I didn't give it much time um, to learn but I thought well rather than um, rather than spending more time learning so let's see if we can improve the this optimization procedure. So rather than just using standard stochastic gradient descent, there's all kinds of things you can tweak. So you can add some momentum, and I don't even know, I don't know what this Nesterov, um, it's this different type of momentum and decay. So um, the yeah, it's a great thing with you don't really have to understand, you can just look it up online and find out what works. So we can see that our loss function now from being 0.2 before, is now down to 0.8, and see what has it learned. Well, it's still not giving us very good reconstructions, but you can see here that it seems to have learned sort of the average shape of the picture. So it's learned that on the outside, it's mostly just white, and the numbers tend to be concentrated in, in the middle kind of um, picture here. And yeah, that was all through an um, improvement in, in the algorithm. And if you don't want to look at a little bit more detail, let's see, um, here we go. Oh, it's the beginning. Let's go right to the beginning. You can see, yeah, so you can see that it's just sort of learned the average picture and not, um, not anything in detail. Now, presumably with more training this would improve, and I haven't done it here for time purposes, but I remember when I did kind of originally do, do this talk and played with it a lot, it actually just seemed to plateau here for a long time. And that's kind of what I tried to point out initially at the, with the signal hill and lion's head thing. That problem is with sort of deeper networks, you can get stuck in sort of plateaus or saddle points where for a long time you're making very marginal incremental improvements and you're going along. Whereas, so I thought, okay, some visual inspection actually kind of helped figure out um, what was going on. So again, just maybe something to... Um, be aware of that, like keep looking at your, your data, what you're producing, what is it doing, rather than saying, oh, it's black box, this is the best loss function, my error rate isn't increasing, saying, oh, actually, have I actually got a useful um, result here? Now, luckily, we can then do better. So here I've got, I uh, just made it myself a utility function, so I could play around with it more, um, more easily. And one of the so there's a number of things that actually led through these breakthroughs. So the one um, was this, the autoencoders, and we'll, I'll do a stacked one later, and we'll see why that helped. But the other thing that's been happening is people have been building better, um, better initializations, better optimizers, and um, all of these combined actually have led to some of the improvements. So just with a simple example, I'm just going to make two changes here. Still keeping the sigmoid activation function, but I'm using Glorot uniform initialization, and um, the optimizer I'm changing to Adam. Now that Adam is actually a very recent optimizer. I think the paper came out last year or maybe 2014. Definitely not older than in two years. And to read the paper; it's quite complex. How it adjusts uh, its step sizes, etc. But again, with Keras, very soon it's on the power of open source. Very soon someone's implemented it, and you can just download an update 
and you just replace SGD here with Adam, and suddenly you've got the latest kind of an optimization technology working for you, which is just awesome. So we see how we work with that, and here just after just one epoch, you can see now we've got some pretty good um, reconstructions. Now obviously, um, yeah, you can train this for longer and do better, but I'm trying to just show you like some of what some of the improvements, even just on simple examples, kind of what the differences it can make. Okay, and again, yeah, if you want to look at some of the more detailed examples here. So, yeah, it gets to seven, two. You can see it sort of blur, smudges it out a bit. Nine, yeah, it's actually done, done a pretty good job. All right, <coughs> now, that was a bit um, out of time. So what actually, um, yeah, that Hinton paper, so it built a stacked autoencoder. I'm not going to go into detail, but basically the I've built this class here for myself that just to, to build it easily. But what we're going to do is we're going to have an autoencoder at with multiple levels. So if you look at this layers line here, we're going to have an input layer of 784 neurons, then a layer with 500 neurons, 150, 50, and then 10. And remember that the autoencoder it we start with the 784, we go to the 500, and we use that to predict the original back. So we learn what features are useful at this layer to predict the original image. But then we use just, the, and so the autoencoder you can think of as an encoder and a decoder. The encoder takes you up from the 784 to the 500 layer, gives you a 500 element representation, and then the decoder maps it back down to 784. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take all of our training examples and map them through the encoder at the first level to get 60,500 element vectors. So we train an autoencoder at, at level one, then encode all the examples, and then build, train another autoencoder um, at the second level. So sort of greedily per, per layer and see whether that gives us um, anything useful. Now, okay, the way I even describe that, um, this example actually shows, well, if you don't do that, if you just build this and you try and build, train this whole thing end to end with all the five layers, what do you get? And it says, oh, that doesn't work very well. You just get this sort of random noise again, because now we've got six layers. So what I've done here then is done this um, layer by layer training. So this is layer one. And I did three epochs. So we first train the layer. And then once we've got a, a good neural network that does a good job of autoencoding at the first layer, we then map all of the examples up to the second layer. And then we do the training at the second layer. Three, another three epochs. Then we map from the second layer to the third layer, train at that layer, and um, so build it up. So that, that was the approach that was um, outlined in that Hinton paper. And ah, okay. So now, uh, the, so the nice thing of this notebook is that it did that. Now we can go back here and update this plot because now it will have the improved um, things. I think. So wait. So, um, so how much? How are we for time? If that lunch is now at one. Because okay. we all, we, it's been shifted up a bit, so I think we have a more time. So more time, okay, cool. So because we can play around now with these um, things at this level. Okay, so that hasn't done <coughs> particularly better. Um, so if you go to the previous layer and say, well, okay, that didn't um, work so well, so let's try something else. Let's, if we change the optimizer to Adam. Um, let's see. There we go. How will that um, prove things? So, it's here, okay, we'll take about a minute, three times 20 seconds. But, yeah, I think for the rest of the tutorials, we can open to questions and we modify some of the examples here and see how that improves the, um, the training. But 
Obviously, these are quite simple, um, quite simple neural networks, uh, small layers. If you look at the the big nets from Google, etc., they're now like 20 layers deep with I don't know hundreds of thousands of neurons, um, like at each layer. I mean, that's big um, industrial operation, uh, operations. You obviously need lots of hardware or compute time to to train those. I mean, the the benefit is that some of them, the ones that win the competitions. So if you care about image recognition, for example, you can download um, competition winners from ImageNet that you can put into Python, and the, the actual evaluation step obviously doesn't take that long. So you can use that to classify images of your own that you need. But um, yeah, I think obviously coming up with deeper architectures and fitting something for your um, needs is still a bit of a, an art in terms of trying to figure out what yeah, you can afford and um, um, yeah, to what level you require to serve your need. Um, let's see, okay, this is finished training. Oh, did I push it again? Uh, another actually nice feature of, um, um, of Keras is that it keeps this, obviously it's a class, it keeps the state. So you can, you don't have to, pre-commit to say, okay, I will need 15 ep epochs of training. You can do th train three epochs, see how it does, does not good enough, you rerun the fit again, and it, it still remembers your weights from the last time, and you just keep updating it and, and training it. So it's not like a batch system where you have to kind of think up front and start from fresh every time. So I think that's also very nice for interactive work. All right, but yeah, we can keep um, playing with this, but some I don't know if you want to open it up for questions. Um, so a, a natural brain obviously doesn't have neat, neatly structured layers. Does mixing the layers up a little bit make it more effective and or harder to manage? Or are brains mixed up because they've evolved and they're not engineered? Um, so I think that... Yeah, there's a lot of um, stuff happening in that space at the at the moment. So, I think what um, I've seen over the last year, what's become quite popular is residual networks. So where they, you, and I don't actually know very much about them. I've sort of glanced at the abstracts of the papers. But the, you you train a neural network, and then you look at, um, like what sort of got did it got wrong? Like looking at the res residual area, and then you train another part of the neural network to try and like fit on that residual, and then you put them all together. Or some other ones, and I don't know what the architecture is called, but you have these um, bypass layers. So you've got, um, so Keras actually now for version 1.1 introduced this functional API so, so that you can have um, multi-branch neural networks. Because before, you could only do kind of one sequential layer with like one branch. Whereas now you can have a neural network with like five layers on the left hand side, and I say the, the signal gets so distorted kind of by the time, or higher, a higher level of abstraction by the time it gets to the top of the fifth layer. Sometimes having access to the lower level representation alongside the higher level representation gives you additional information. So then on the right hand side, you pass through these um, pass through layers that just so sometimes it's just identity map that passes the original. Um, signal back up, and then at layer six, you use the original. That. So th some of those architectures, I think, have been doing very well um, lately. So I think if you look for your the residual nets, uh, I think that you might find some stuff on that. There's also the there was the inception architecture, which I can't remember exactly how it works, but takes its cue from the film Inception. So you yeah. can imagine what um, <laughs> it's sort of somewhat self-referential. Um, so I think there are benefits um, to those things, um, yeah. Let me just see how we've improved here now. Uh, uh. Okay, yes, so is there a question? Yeah. Yes. Um, my question is, is there a way to serialize the weights or how do you transfer the pre-trained um, uh, weights into a new, a new session? Yeah, so Keras also makes that easy. So it's got two methods, like um, two YAML, I think, for the model. So once you've um, arrived at your architecture and you're happy with it, you can serialize it to YAML format and then just store that in a text file. 
and then you can just load it from YAML again. And same for the weights. And um, what I actually used somewhere earlier on is there's got save weights and lo load weights functions on the model class. And um, it writes those to HDF5 files, um, which is a, f a good binary representation for kind of lots of um, um, yeah, the binary data, kind of big tables of data. So also Keras makes that yeah, very simple. So that's how you get the weights from the big neural networks that are internationally trained. You can download the, the HDF5 files and then just load them into your, into your network. OK, so we can see here, just an update, changing the, the optimizer there to, um, to Adam. Again, got us so to the average representation, but it's not great. So let me just skip ahead now to the, the one that I know kind of works best. Um, so if we switch this to a uh, ReLU, now, um, here, form Adam, got dropped out, and then we're going to do the, we have to sort of jump ahead, uh, let's see, uh, where is it not fit, there was another slide, go down, um, page down, here we go this pre-trained slide. Okay, um, so we've got to wait a little bit for that to train. Right, any, <coughs> any other questions? Otherwise, then I can... Um, oh, there's one. Hi, um, are there rules, maybe rules of thumb, to decide how many um, neurons you have per Per, per layer, or how do you decide how, how those um, how many per layer you have there? Okay, so the the run rule of thumb here was that for the autoencoder, you need less neurons than you had on the input. Otherwise, the net just learns the identity function because it can perfectly represent the input. So you need some form of regularization. So not. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so you need some form of regu uh, hello. Hello, hello. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, some form of regularization. So you can either have that by having a what's it called, like um, bottlenecking it, so making it um, giving it less neurons to work with. Otherwise, you can add some sort of L2 or L1 regularization penalty to your objective function. Or what also works very well is a dropout, where you sort of randomly at each epoch or at each mini batch switch off a certain proportion of the um, of the your um, yeah of the neurons that are active, which helps um, from prevents them from learning too much co-adaption taking place. So th sometimes otherwise you just have like, oh, well, this one pixel is always, if that's a one, then that's a zero, otherwise it's a five or something. You can have very specific features and that's maybe the way the, the data set has been set up, whereas you want it to be more robust to um, those sort of things. So by n having dropout, you, yeah, you're only using 30% of the neurons or 60% every time, and it learns to learn a generalized, um, decentralized representation of the input space that's kind of quite robust to individual changes. Now, like, uh, I mean, convolutional neural networks also do that to some extent, but they're normally quite small patches, so they blur out some of the microstructure, but there's n it's not quite this, um, the same. Whereas the dropout, because it's random over the full feature set, it sort of gives you more global kind of um, uh, robustness. And, and, in, and in that case, you might actually introduce a very big layer. So for a 784 input example, you would introduce a thousand layer, a thousand neuron layer with 50% dropout. So you only have 500 active, so it still can't learn the, um, can't learn the input perfectly, but it's learning to learn a, a decentralized representation of the problem. So 
I don't know how important that is in the, the sort of latest work. I know like Jeff Hinton kind of initially thought that was a big key, that like you're learning hierarchical representations of um, things um, that might be due to kind of personal, um, you're kind of trying to build a brain, so you think that's how things should work. Um, a lot of the stuff that we found now is that um, stuff often just, some things work very well and it's not always that um, clear why. So the analogies of the brain maybe don't, aren't always perfect. But, um, so that would be some, so some guideline. Um, apart from that, I don't know, I guess if you can think about the complexity of your thing, you'd, yeah, I'm not sure how you would do it in, in practice. Um, let's see, is this finished? Um, okay, let's assume so. Yeah, so what we did here, the, the layer by layer um, pre training was, oh, it's called pre training. So you kind of, because that's kind of quite rough, so we try and get the right um, features at each layer. And then we can do one more layer uh, um, of end-to-end -end training up here, or one, three more epochs, which they you know, sort of call fine-tuning. So you learn sort of broad representations at each layer, and then finally you do want the, the network to work well as a, as a fully integrated network. So then you do some more training with all the layers switched on in, in one task for <coughs> fine-tuning. And then we'll see, yeah, I'll just give it a couple of seconds, see when it comes back. <coughs> so I think what you've got to keep in mind about this network now is that while it's got quite a lot of weights, in the end the information is condensed down to 10 numbers. Right? So the, it goes all the way up the network into a 10 number representation and then it gets passed back down. So we want to see how much of the original shape can we remember just from from just from ten numbers. And like I said, this is quite important because it's it gives us a, uh, a way into unsupervised learning, right? So I don't know if you look at machine learning. There's a lot of talk about neural networks done great for supervised learning. It's great if you've got lots of labeled data, but in the real world, where you're going to get your labels from, etc. So with these autoencoders. It allows you to learn useful features from your data in an unsupervised um, fashion. So you can see, oh, maybe is there, are there clusters in the data or similar behavior? Um, let's see here. Live demo, let's hope this works. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's. Not too bad. I mean, you see, it generally looks some um, somewhat alike. I mean, <coughs> and if we let's say we go to the next slide, if we look at it in detail, yeah. So here's a bit of a four nine. You can see you get can get quite a lot of detail back, even though putting it down to a ten, a ten f number representation, and then. I mean, obviously there are there is a lot of information encoded in the weights in all of the layers, so it's kind of like if you're doing compression, you've got a dictionary of, of things that you've learned, then you can just reconstruct things there. But um, <coughs> yeah, I still think it's quite a sorry quite what a cool result. What button are you pressing to switch? Uh, left and right. Oh, okay. Do you uh, click on the J first? Or yeah, yeah, I clicked on the J uh, first okay. and then I switch okay. left and right. Um, I, see, I see you generating um, images there from, from your model. So it's, so it's a generative model. Um, are all neural networks generative? Because um, I've, I've done machine learning but not neural networks, so just interested. Um, or, or do you have also just discriminative neural networks? Yeah, so I don't think this is actually a generative. I mean, I know like if you do a, um, like variational autoencoders are generative, and I, I, I haven't had time to to go into those in detail. And this is quite a simplistic one. So I'm not generating them. I'm starting with the input image, uh, mapping it up, and then mapping it back. If I, 
if I just did um, uniformly distributed numbers at the top layer and then mapped them down, not sure what we would get out. It's, so it's not a pure generative model. Um, it is kind of tra uh, trained. But um, you do get um, variational autoencoders, which I think is definitely where it's at now, like you'd want to do one of those. And if you come join the Cape Town Deep Learning Meetup, let's go and work t on that as the next task. Um, I'd be keen. It's just, yeah, time-wise, it's kind of the level where, where I've got to. <laughs> All right, so that's kind of yeah, the main result that I wanted to show. Um, finally, just yeah, thanks for your attention. Um, so the organizer, we are hiring for a data scientist, so go and check out the, the repo on the Bitbucket if you're interested and want to work on machine learning on kind of financial um, problems. And finally, I'll just also come join the Cape Town Deep Learning Meetup. Um, we haven't been at, as active as of late, but we had a, there was a machine learning open um, space yesterday, and, and it seems like quite a lot of people are interested, so we're trying to get more active and more um, get more meetups going again in the future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.